Let's look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 30. The context, remember, the context is that this is a tribulation passage. This is dealing with Jews. The Jews are warned, starting at verse 26, to make sure they do not sin willfully and they don't trot underfoot the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what that is covering is basically where they forsake their tribulation church and then join the side of the Antichrist. That is the unpardonable sin. That is receiving 666. And we've covered some interesting parts on what happens when you leave the church or when you get churched, and that's a very dangerous thing. Uh, you're basically surrendered to the hands of the devil. That's a very dangerous thing. And that covers the power of binding and loosing that Roman Catholic fumble on, that they teach wrong doctrine on. Understanding that context, that's why verse 30, it reads, For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. So the author is saying that we Jews know God who said this statement before, that he believes and he mentioned that vengeance belongs to him. That's what God said. Vengeance belongs to me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. So God said that he's going to be the one who will pay back if you don't live right. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. The author is quoting another scripture verse that God is going to judge his people. That's the Jews if they don't live right. So it's a forewarning. God's going to give them vengeance. Now, the two passages that are quoted here are in Deuteronomy 32. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. And we will read verse 35 through 36, verses 35 through 36. Notice that the vengeance is related more specifically to the second advent. So the second advent is another word for the second coming of Jesus Christ. One day, Jesus Christ, he is going to come down on this earth after the tribulation ends. So sometime at the end of the tribulation, uh, let me put it this way, that way it's less confusing. So sometime at the end of the tribulation, the Lord is going to come down and smite his enemies. This is the tribulation timeline. During the tribulation timeline, the Antichrist, he is ruling over the world, giving the mark of the beast. Those who receive the mark of the beast, and by context of Hebrews 10, those Jews are in danger of that, right? God's warning them, do not take 666. If those Jews... If a particular Jew takes 666, then what's going to happen to him is that he is going to then experience Jesus Christ's second advent. What's that? That's the vengeance Hebrews 10 is talking about. So Hebrews 10 is warning the Jews, I'm going to, have, I'm going to avenge myself on you if you commit the unpardonable sin by taking 666 and tread the blood of my son through your willful sin. That's what the whole context is of, verse, uh, of Hebrews chapter 10 from the last five verses that we've covered. Last five verses or so that we covered. This is known as vengeance. This is known as day of vengeance and wrath. The scripture that the author of Hebrews is quoting from is what we're going to look at, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 35. To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste 
So that's the one verse the author of Hebrews quoted. But remember, the author of Hebrews said, and again, and he quotes another passage, right? The other passage is verse 36. <clears throat> For the Lord shall judge his people. Now, side note, maybe, maybe this is a nice way to see that probably God believes in separating verses. You'll notice 35, 36, they're numbered, they're separated. But the originals, they're not supposed to. They have it together. So then why would the author of Hebrews say 35 and then separate it from 36? So anyways, it's just food for thought. Food for thought that maybe the Lord might be behind putting down verse separations right there. Something for modern Bible version critics that they won't be able to stomach. <laughs> Anyways, when we look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32, 35 through 36, these are the two scripture verses where the, uh, that the author of Hebrews is quoting. God will judge his people. That is his vengeance on them if they take 666. That's why they've got to be careful. Now, notice that this is God's judgment. This is God's wrath. This is God's vengeance. It all matches up <coughs> when we go to Matthew 20, uh, Luke 21. Luke 21. Notice that during his coming, that the time period is described to be his vengeance. Go to Luke 21. Luke 21. Jesus Christ told the disciples when they are to look up, they're going to see Jesus Christ return, land on the earth, and during that time, they are undergoing God's vengeance. So they have to be careful of that. They've got to be careful when God avenges himself on his people. To avoid that, that's why they can't sin willfully. They've got to endure to the end. Look at Luke chapter 21. The Bible points out at verse 22, verse 22, for these be the days of what? Vengeance. And notice the time period is aligned with in verse 27, verse 27, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Notice it is aligned with Jesus' second coming. That's why... In verse 26, notice that people are afraid when Jesus comes down. Why? He's avenging himself on them. Verse 26, men's heart failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. See, it's coming. It's coming. So you better behave. That's what Jesus Christ is telling them. All right. Um, let me see if this one more passage can do it justice. Let me make sure. Yes, actually it can. Go to 2 Thessalonians 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Notice that God speaks even to the Christian church that God will avenge himself of our enemies on this earth. Why? Because while we are up in heaven... Those who've mocked us on this earth while we were on earth, they're left behind. And then they undergo the tribulation. And then Jesus Christ is going to come down and pay them back. That's the reason why those Jews, they shouldn't join that bunch. They've got to endure unto the end. Because God has been saving up his vengeance, believe it or not, ever since 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Come on. So that's 2,000 years of vengeance that God is landing on them. That's pretty scary right there. If you go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and then verse 4, So that we ourselves glory in you, in the churches of God, for your patience and faith, in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. Now, don't be confused. This is not talking about... Uh, the seven-year tribulation here. Notice this is tribulations, right? So it's another word simply meaning trials, hard times. That's all it means. So here is the Christian church who undergo trouble. We endure trouble <coughs> from what? The wicked world. That's why verse 5, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God. See that? God is judging. 
So he's going to pay them back after all the persecution, all the crud that we took from the wicked lost world. Now you keep reading down. The Bible says uh, in verse 5, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. We are. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense. Remember God said he's going to recompense, mm -hmm. give them judgment. Notice tribulation to them that trouble you. Ah, notice a singular tribulation here. You wonder why this time period can be rightfully called tribulation. You wonder why Luke rightfully calls this days of vengeance. So notice that this, it is accurate to say, it is not incorrect to say that this entire tribulation timeline can be known as days of vengeance, God's vengeance upon the earth, uh, as well as his judgment. And then we've got a final one, the big one, which is the day of vengeance and the day of judgment at the end of that. That's the reason why, think about this. So here are these Jews, right? So these Jews did not, got, did not get saved in the church. If they did not get saved in the church, what's going on? God's judgment and wrath is on them because they're still with the lost world here. As they enter the tribulation, they're still receiving that because they're not saved. That's why that Jew got to get out of that judgment, got to get out of that by enduring to the end, by becoming saved in the tribulation. Otherwise, he's been going through, what, 2,000 years of God's stored wrath through the church age, and then during the tribulation, bam, and then the final big one, bam, 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 bam. That's what we're noticing right here. Look at uh, verse 8. Vengeance is used. In flaming fire, <coughs> uh, excuse me, verse 7, and to you who are troubled, so we went through the trouble from the lost world, right? Yeah. The verse says, rest with us right. when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Mm -hmm. So this yeah. indicates here, it's as if that we're up, in heaven with God, the Christian church is up in heaven with God, they're at rest. When they are at rest with God, then the Lord reveals himself from heaven and wipes out the enemy for us. Because it says rest and then with us, right? It's as if that the believers are going to be in a different location resting while God's going to come down on the earth and wipe out his enemies. See that? So it sounds like as if we're not down there when it happens, but rather that we're someplace else and that is the rapture. When you keep reading onward in verse 8, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord uh, uh, and from the glory of his power. So notice right here that uh, God Almighty himself, he's going to get vengeance on them. That's what the verse says. So it matches up very well with 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. So 2 Thessalonians 1 <coughs> is Pauline, and it shows the Pauline background and element with Hebrews 10. So Hebrews 10, I believe, is written by Paul. It just matches with that 2 Thessalonians 1. But the verse about vengeance belonging to God, I will repay, is repeated by Paul at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Now that's mostly a Pauline thing. It's not really from other biblical writers. We see how the phrase... Vengeance belongs to me, saith the Lord, I will repay, I will recompense. That's more like a Pauline line or a Pauline phrase. When we look at Romans chapter 12, notice <coughs> in verse 19, verse 19, Paul writes, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, 
I will repay, saith the Lord. See, it just matches well with Hebrews 10. All right, let's go back to Hebrews 10 now. Hebrews 10. There's a lot of rich stuff uh, that I've yet to show you in Hebrews 10. You're going to get a blessing out of this one. Let me just get back to the subject here. Now, in verse 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. No kidding. So I'm going to be explaining each and every word. Remember that. <coughs> The author of Hebrews is saying because of such vengeance that you can undergo during the tribulation, if you uh, don't get saved, if you don't avoid the willful sin, it's going to be a very fearful thing that time when you're in God's hands because God says, I'm going to pay you back one day. That's the idea, right? Yeah. So in those hands is a very fearful thing. We're going to look at John chapter 10, John chapter 10. Now, a Christian can certainly take any uh, spiritual application out of that. Jonathan Edwards preached a very great sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. In other words, uh, say believer or people during this Christian timeline ought to fear the Lord. I mean, God's hands, it's very scary. I kind of preached a bit about that at Sunday, right? I kind of preached a bit about that Sunday on how scary the Lord can be with those hands of His. You don't want, basically, don't mess with God, right? Yeah. Don't mess with God. Those hands, I mean, uh, it created you and I, and those hands, it's going to pronounce judgment. I mean, it's the one that can condemn you to hell fire. Right. Holy hands, holy hands, and then it's only a matter of time that He could just place his hands on you. When he puts his hands on you, buddy, like you hear people saying when, they're, when they want to avenge themselves, wait till I get my hands on you. That's basically what the Lord has been saying for 2,000 years. Wait till I get my hands on you. Now that's scary stuff. That's scary stuff. So it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands uh, of God. However, that's doctrinally, from Hebrews chapter 10, that is not accurate. In Hebrews chapter 10, the doctrine is referring to the tribulation timeline. See, he's really upset. He can't wait to get his hands on them. Notice that Paul is speaking to Hebrews. And Hebrews, they're actually scared of God's hand here. Why are they scared of God's hand? The reason why they're scared of God's hand here is because God says, I can't wait to get my hands on you if they commit that willful sin. Once they, once they conjoin themselves with the Antichrist, they conjoin themselves with God's 2,000 years of wrath that he stored and saved up. So those Jews are actually scared of God's hand. They're not the ones that are comforted or at peace. You and I, however, when it comes to God's hand, it's not actually something, doctrinally speaking, where we're scared of. Although spiritually we can see some things, like I mentioned to you before, but a, the doctrinal application when it comes to God's hand is there's no better place to be in. Man. There's no better place to be in. When it comes to God's hand, we're not thinking about God who can't wait to get his hands on us. Yeah. We're not undergoing or thinking or living like that. Right. What we're thinking about is there's no better place than to be there. Yeah. If you get outside of God's hands, that's on you. That's right. The scary place to be in is when you get outside of God's hand, right. not in his hands. Right. See that? The reason why is because John chapter 10, notice right here, this all relates to eternal security. That's right, amen. So for the Christian church, this is actually assurance, not fear. Notice the opposite here. You see these two boxes? That's good, preacher. It's an opposite That's reaction. Wow. The church has assurance when it comes to God's hand, but the Jew has fear when it comes to God's hand, actually. 
So let's look at John chapter 10. Notice that when you and I are saved in the Lord Jesus Christ, that nothing can get us outside of Jesus Christ's hand. So when people say that when you sin, watch out because God can't wait to get his hands on you. No, that's doctrinally incorrect. When you mess up in your life, you're still stuck in God's hand. Amen. See how that is totally opposite from Hebrews 10? Yeah. Hebrews 10, they're not supposed to mess up. Yeah. But Christians, even when they mess up, they don't have to worry. They're still stuck. Nothing, absolutely nothing can get you outside of God's hand. Look at John chapter 10. Notice what uh, Jesus claims right here. In verse 28, and I give unto them what kind of life? Eternal, eternal life. In verse 28, Jesus Christ gives eternal life, not temporary, not conditional. Amen. It's eternal. That means it's fixed. Amen. And they shall never perish. Amen. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So that means even the Antichrist. Yeah, come on. See that? Amen. That means anyone who causes you to sin. Wow. See that? So nothing should be able, uh, not even yourself. See, any man includes you. I think that's what God means by any man, right? That would include you. So you can't even get yourself outside of Jesus Christ's hand. Verse 29, my father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. So not only Jesus Christ's hand, but God the Father's hand. You got a double eternal security. Not just eternal security, but a double eternal security. So for us... When we talk about the hands of God, it's something that's assuring. It's not something that we have to fear. Now, I want you to go to, this is a good one, go to 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12. So think about this. This has to do with eternal security then. This one is opposite of eternal security. This is losing salvation here. Here we see losing salvation versus salvation being secured, securing salvation, eternal security. See how opposite they are? So when people tell you that uh, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of God and they're saying that doctrinally to you saved Christians, that's doctrinally incorrect. That is completely incorrect. If people use it for like some preaching in a spiritual application, that's perfectly fine. God gives you liberty on that one. But don't teach it as doctrine. That's not the case. We're going to look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The good one is this. You're not only in his hand, you're a part of his hand. Amen. If you're a part of his hand, that means you're part of his body, right? The church is known as what? The church is known as the body of Christ. Because it is known as the body of Christ, this further proves that the body of Christ is not undergoing the tribulation. Why? Because why would the body of Christ be scared of itself? It doesn't make sense. It's not going to do that. As a matter of fact, the hand can't say to a different body part, I have no need of you. They're still stuck together. But over here at the tribulation, they're all doing what they can to avoid God's fearful hand. Why? Because God's hand during this time is not keeping them. God's hand is, I can't wait to get my hands on you. His hands are just pounding them right now. So in this time period, God is slapping them. In this time period, God is holding them. After all, remember this whole time period, like I told you before, it's not incorrect to say this is known as God's vengeance, God's judgment. So his hand is slapping them that time. And then this time period, he's holding them in this time. So this shows that the body of Christ is not going to go through the tribulation. Amen. The body of Christ has to go up. That makes the most sense. The body of Christ has to be raptured. All right. So we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And then uh, let me draw this where it can go along with the rapture very well. 
All right. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. <coughs> the Bible points out in verse 12, For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. If you keep reading down, the Bible says in verse 21, verse 21, And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you, nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. Now this should be very, very powerful. This verse points out that these body members uh, cannot separate from each other. See, the hand can't say that to one body part and that other body part can't say vice versa to the hand. That's the point of the author right there. Amen. So Christ's hand can't tell you, I have no need of you. Well, I'm not that good. My spiritual walk is not good in the Lord. I'm not really an ideal Christian. Well, the verse pointed out right here that Christ's body can give it more abundant honor to that part that lacked. Notice right here, eternal security again. Notice in verse 25, this is powerful, that there should be no schism in the body. Amen. So notice right here, it is absolutely impossible that one body part can be lost, can be cut off. That's what that verse says. Schism means where there's a division, where there's a cutting off, a separation. Absolutely impossible. Absolutely impossible. All right, now let's go back to Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10. I still got some more goodies here. It gets better. It, a lot of good stuff here. A lot of good stuff here. Now, notice that you can get this much gleaning through dispensational lens. You notice that? But notice if we applied everything here to a Christian, then we would have lost these rich gleanings, even for Christians to gain these gleanings. How Christians are able to gain rich gleanings by looking at a tribulation doctrine is because recognizing that God's hand, the fearful part of God's hand, is tribulation to begin with. By understanding that to begin with, we were able to gain a gleaning of what God's hand means differently to Christians. Yeah. That it is security. That it is comfort. We wouldn't have learned that if uh, we applied, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God to Christians. But notice by, dispens uh, by a dispensational method, rightly dividing it to tribulation Jew, Christians were able to gain a better blessing right. from looking at that verse. That's good, preacher. All right, so let's look at Hebrews chapter 10 and then verse 32. Amen. But call to remembrance <coughs> the former days in which after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of afflictions. All right, so Paul is telling the Hebrews to call to remembrance. So it's plain, as, uh, it's plain and simple, call to mind. The former days, your past, what you went through before, what happened before. It's in which you, after you got to know the truth, that's illuminated, right? Your eyes got open. You all uh, endured a lot of afflictions. You greatly fought it. You went through a lot of afflictions. Why? Verse 33, partly, so ba partly the reason is whilst you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst you became companions of them that were so used. <laughs> So partly the reason is because you were uh, made a laughing stock. That's the idea. You are entertainment uh, by wicked people who uh, reproached you and afflicted you. Reproaches and afflictions is what made you a laughing stock. That's the idea. And partly the other reason is because while you were uh, friends, you conjoined yourself with those who were used as laughingstock as well. 
In other words, the verse is saying, for based on the reason why you went through a lot, is because of, in one sense, you were made a laughing stock. In the other sense, you joined those who were a laughing stock. So ye became companions of them. It shows that you are helping out those who were mocked by the world. That's the reason why you were persecuted and afflicted. So that's what Paul is writing to the Jews. He says at verse 34, For ye had compassion on me and my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and enduring substance. Meaning that because you had compassion on me while I was going uh, through imprisonment, you joyfully took all the spoiling of your goods. So you got the spoils, you got the goods. Knowing that in, your, uh, that in yourself, you know deep down inside yourself that you're going to get a much better and a long-lasting, basically a permanent reward. That's what the substance is up in heaven. Amen. You're going to get something better in heaven. So that's what the author of Hebrews is writing. Now, if Paul is writing this to Hebrews, there's one thing to notice right here. Notice he says, had compassion on me. Notice in my bonds, right? Yeah. In my bonds. So this shows that when he's writing the book of Hebrews, it's sometime during his imprisonment or likely even after his imprisonment. Remember I mentioned to you before that if Paul was the one who uh, wrote the book of Hebrews, it seems like that the author Paul wrote it during a time that was before or when he's being introduced the doctrine of the body of Christ, the Christian church age doctrine. If Paul wrote... Hebrews at time, then why is it that in this verse it seems like it was at a much later time in the church, church age, right? So that is the question here. I've been receiving a few questions on that one, but I didn't answer because I want to wait till we come uh, to the latter part of the book of Hebrews. Is the writing of the book of Hebrews this time period? Or is it sometime well underway during the church age? Which could be, let's just put it here. Then you get Hebrews 13. Go to Hebrews 13. Shows right here, he already knew Timothy. Yeah. He already knew Timothy that time. Go to Hebrews chapter 13. <coughs> In verse 23, notice that the author says that you, know, you all know about our brother Timothy. Now, Timothy was long underway during the church age doctrine, that time period. Hebrews 13, 23, Know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty, with whom if he comes shortly, I will see you. So then what's the explanation to all this? How do we explain all this? Well, why not both? See that? That's the simple answer here. So then these two arrows are correct. Is that very possible? Absolutely possible. The reason why is because there are several books of the Bible that are written out that way. One great example is the book of Deuteronomy. Now, Deuteronomy is written by Moses. If Moses wrote the book of Deuteronomy, notice that the last chapter, how would he write about what really happened to him and how he died, and then put it in past tense. That's the reason why critics, they'll try to say, see, Moses wasn't really the author of the book of Deuteronomy. It's some kind of later uh, editors or redactors, they would call them, etc. But the simple answer to that is, when you look at the next book of the Bible, Joshua, Josh, it was very possible, and the verse even shows, that Joshua wrote some of the things in the law of Moses. So Joshua could have just simply finished off the story. Right. When a book of the Bible is being written out, it does not have to be in one specific time period. That's right. It's a book that can take time. Yeah. Aren't there authors like that? 
It's yeah, that simple. There are authors who write a book, but then they'll like say, let me get a break, I'll uh, write it later. Or they just get a fog in their brain and they're like, you know, I don't have any other ideas coming in and writing. So that, that's very normal. That happens. So it's a normal thing in life. Paul could have done the same thing as well. If he wrote it during this time, it makes a lot of sense why he was writing do uh, tribulation doctrine to Jews. Understanding church age doctrine, why would he continue the doctrine for tribulation Jews? The simple answer is because he is still undergoing that transitional time period of Jews and Gentiles. That's important to understand. He was still undergoing that uh, transitional time of Jews and Gentiles. A lot of people don't understand. In this picture, it's simplified. When it's simplified, we assume that a church age starts at some beginning point. But to be quite honest, the church was undergoing ever since right here. Yeah. It should be more so the blue should be over here and then the black should be uh, pointing out like that. However, the reason why we draw it this way is it becomes more simple for people to understand. That's the reason why I did that. The reason why we simplify it this way is because notice right here, this is the kingdom time period, right? You notice that right here? And I'm going to show that later. Hopefully I'll reach those verses. But this is the gospel of the kingdom being preached throughout this time period. You'll notice that it is undergoing the time of Christ to the end of the tribulation. The gospel of the kingdom is being preached. But what happened is there's a disruption here. The disruption is the church age. The Christian church comes in. Why did this disrupt it? Because notice right here this transition of Jews going to Gentiles. If the Jews received their Messiah, then what would have happened? You won't need this. See that? You won't need this. But this disrupted it because the Jews rejected God. That's why God switched it, notice right here, to Gentiles. Because God switched it to Gentiles and then cut off his clock with the Jews, he temporarily and partially cast them aside and turned toward the Gentiles. That's why there's a disruption in the clock and the Jews won't get their clock continuing until the church age is done, which is the rapture. When the church gets raptured up to heaven, the Jewish clock can continue with their gospel of the kingdom. That's the reason why it was simplified this way. But... In reality, the church was undergoing ever since this time. When the church was undergoing this, undergoing this time, it was starting with Jews and transitioning to Gentiles. But once the Jews were cut off, then it's, notice right here, completely undergoing a stop of Jewish timeline and Gentiles. God turned to the Gentiles. That's what's going on over here. Why is it that the church would be starting over here during this transition? Simple, because the reason why is while God is getting his operation of the church undergoing, at the same time, he can deal with his national operation with Jews. It's that simple. That's the reason why. I'm not going to try to go uh, get deep. That way people don't get lost. But that's the reason why in Acts chapter 2, while the church is forming, See, while the church doctrine operation is forming ever since Acts 2, because the church operation started at that time, it was starting at that time and it was forming. While it's undergoing that, God can at the same time deal nationally with his Jewish people. The Jewish people, they're undergoing a national operation as well as, get this, a spiritual church operation. Uh, wow. A lot of mid-Acts uh, hyper-dispensationalists don't realize that. Yeah. A lot of mid-Acts hyper-dispensationalists think that it has to be just a national operation and then after that, a church spiritual operation. Yeah. Why not both? Can't God do both at the same time? As a matter of fact, if you study dispensations, it's very common God can do both at the same yeah. time. Yeah. For example, the Mosaic Law, wasn't, it, wasn't that time period functioning during David's yeah. dispensation? That's right. That's right. Come on. David's dispensation is a separate dis dispensation, 
but it's undergoing the same function as the Mosaic Law time period. So a lot of mid-axe hyperdispensationalists think that you can neatly clean it off in division like that. That's not how it works. We do this that way you can better picture it, but when you look at it more deeply, that's not how it works, actually. Amen. That's not how it works. Amen. So visually, we do this that way it's simplified. That way we get it more. But once you get the simplified version, now you got to look into it more deeply. See that? And when you look at it more deeply, then what happens is the simplified visuals diminish and you get the more technical details that you didn't see before. That's the thing that a lot of mid-acts uh, dispensationalists, they pride themselves and they boast online that, hey, we're better than those Bible-believing KJV-only dispensationalists because they're all a part of Ruckman's camp and they don't know what they're talking about. We're better dispensationalists than them. No, they're amateur, very amateur and dispensational. They go through kiddie versions in their nice little drawings. That's why they need drawings. You know why they draw so much of dispensational charts? Because they're so amateurish in their knowledge of dispensationalism, they need visual aid. But the thing is this, is that there's nothing wrong with visual aid, but you need to grow up out of it. Once you get the visual aid, you need to study that more intently. And then what you're going to find out is when you look at the details, as you get inside the, the visuals more and more, is that it becomes more, intric it's becomes more intricate and complex than you think. The mid-axe dispensationalists, they're very amateurish dispensationalists. If you watch them, then you... You audience members uh, have to keep in mind this, is that I hope that you're not being an amateur yourself drawn away from visual stuff, visual kitty stuff. Usually that's what attracts you, right? That, you're not going to find truth that way. We walk by faith, not by sight. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Y'all look at the Bible. A lot of times even, I just need to park it a little bit here, but when I'm giving you Bible teaching, are you even looking at that verse? Are you examining the verse? Or are you just visually watching me and then think that you're getting verses? That's good. That's good, preacher. See that? The Lord's going to test you to see how much you're going to study into that book. Are you going to rely more on sight or by studying His Word? If you go more by sight, then you will get caught with mid-axe hyperdispensationalism if you're not careful. Wow. All right, but anyway, uh, changing... Uh, <laughs> I say all that stuff, I, some of you are like, this is over my head. Uh, other people are like, whoa, that was actually very helpful with dispensationalism. But I had to uh, mention, this is uh, the teaching on Hebrews after all. So we're going to come across some heavy meat here and there. But I hope that it was explained in a way where you get the gist at least, right? So hopefully you got the gist and this was extremely very helpful to you. So... Uh, let's see. Returning to the subject at hand, I just lost the main point here. Returning to the subject at hand is that uh, Paul is the author, and when he wrote he and when he wrote Hebrews, it is very possible that he wrote it during the time when the body of Christ is being introduced, as well as some time after he introduced the body of Christ doctrine. Why? Because it was still undergoing a transition. The evidence is very, very plain that it was still transitioning from Jew to Gentile when you go to Acts chapter 19. So if you go to Acts chapter 19, we won't spend so much time there, but if you go to Acts chapter 19 there, notice that these are Jews, and these Jews, they're receiving... Uh, a baptism of the Holy Spirit. When they receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they also speak in tongues. And this is very different from what we see in uh, Paul's teaching concerning about Christians. We don't get water baptized to receive the Holy Ghost or to speak in tongues. Tongues actually cease. Those are for Jews. And water baptism is not required to receive the Holy Spirit. That is for Jews back at Acts chapter 2. But notice this happened at Acts 19. Mid-Acts dispensationalists, they're such amateurs that some of them, they can't start at Acts chapter 10. Yeah. 
They have to go past Acts 19 because of that, because they see that problem. So they think that, some of them think that church age doctrine from Paul wasn't even taught before Acts 19. See, that's the kind of mess that you get in if you don't believe that two things are, can be undergoing at the same time. If you honestly think that one has to stop and the other one has to, uh, has to end and then uh, start anew, then if you think that's how dispensational time periods work, you absolutely know zero Bible. Come on. You absolutely know zero Bible. There's, uh, you can have two, three time periods undergoing where God's different operations are undergoing. That's very, very possible. That's very, very scriptural when you read the Word of God. Anyway, when you go to Hebrews 10, Hebrews chapter 10, so I, w I went off all that on Paul's authorship. I don't want to yeah. do that. So uh, let's return to verse 32 through 34. We understand Paul's authorship now, but let me uh, now get to 32 to 34. That way you can get a blessing here. So first, remember, this is doctrinally to tribulation Jews, right? So doctrinally to tribulation Jews, Paul is speaking to them that uh, you're undergoing basically great persecution, right? From the unbelieving crowd. From the unbelieving crowd, you're made a laughing stock. You're made an entertainment to them. And you're even mocked for helping out those, for helping out those who are mocked and who are a laughing stock to the wicked world. They even were mocked and reproached for helping out Paul. They were a companion and they were a help to Paul. By aiding him, in return, they receive persecution. But Paul assured them that by being a companion to those who are persecuted for God, you will gain a reward for that. Now, notice that in verse 35, that's why Paul says, cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. Paul is telling them to please don't uh, cast away, so don't throw away, you know, don't waste uh, your confidence. Ah, so remember that word confidence is used. Do you remember what that word confidence is? If you forgot, you got to go back to Hebrews chapter 3 and 4. But remember, confidence is referring to not blessed assurance, not assurance of your salvation. The opposite. It's referring to losing your salvation here. Confidence is in context here of their salvation at stake. They can always have a confident salvation as long as they hold on to it. Remember, that was the whole idea of Hebrews 3 and 4. So the context is their salvation. If they fail, then that verse shows if they fail to aid those who are persecuted by the Antichrist, yeah. aid those who are being persecuted by the enemy, aid the preachers during the tribulation, then they can lose their salvation. They're going to lose their reward. That's the idea when you keep reading, which hath great recompense of reward. That confidence is accompanied, it's integrated with a great repayment from God of a great reward. Should I show this? Not yet. Okay, I won't explain verse 36 yet. I want you to go to now several passages if we look at the book of Matthew 24 and then James 5. Matthew 24 and then James 5. Matthew 24 and James 5. Actually, I think I'll have to explain that part. Okay, let me, um, this is all combined together, so I'm going to have to read verse 36 and 37. So there's a lot of verses here, and then we'll have to close it off for the night. Hopefully I can show you the Christian application, that way you can get a blessing. All right, verse 36 to 37, the author is saying, For ye have need of patience, 
that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. So the author is saying that these tribulation Jews need patience. They have to endure all that uh, affliction and reproach until they've completed the will of God. That shows right here that during this tribulation timeline, they have to endure until they fulfill God's will, God's task for them. That's the idea. So it indicates right here a timeline that they have to endure. See that? Then they'll be able to receive God's promise at the end. So notice right here the 1,000-year reign of Jesus Christ. That's where they're going to gain their reward. So they have to endure through all this. They have to be patient till then. And then once after they complete it, then they're going to receive that promise, that reward, which is during the millennium. Verse 37, for yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. The author then shows right here, it's only a little while that you have to endure. Then when Jesus Christ said he, he's going to come, he will come. And he's not going to take long. After all, the tribulation, whether you believe it's three and a half or seven years, it is a little while. It won't take long. So it's just a few years. And then Jesus Christ gave a promise, I'm going to come. Remember he gave that promise to his disciples? Yep, he's going to fulfill it. He's going to come. Now I'm going to, uh, and he's not going to delay. Now I'm going to show you how all these verses combine together. Here we go. So let's do all of this. 32 through 37, all right? This is, so keep all that information you heard so far, all right? That way you can see the blessing, how all these verses match perfectly. They're all talking about the same thing. It's going to hit together very, very well. Okay, so let's uh, start out right here with uh, Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Let me show you the first blessing here. The first blessing is in Matthew chapter 24. It's not really a blessing, but it'll be a blessing to you because it's just doctrinally cool. Okay, that's what I meant. When you go to Matthew chapter 24, we know that this is a chapter about the tribulation. We know that, right? I mean, your pastor is probably more post-trib than those post-tribbers <laughs> in espousing Matthew 24, okay? And that's a joke, okay? But we all know that's the chapter about the tribulation. Notice, this is very interesting. He says at... Uh, Starting at verse 4 is when Jesus Christ begins the tribulation, right? So he shows in verse 5 the coming of the Antichrist, right? Verse 6, we can see the other se uh, seven seals of revelation in verse 6, right? Then in verse 7, continuing on, continuing on the seven seals of re revelation, then verse 8, he says these are the beginning of sorrows. But then at verse 9, he says... They're going to deliver you up to be afflicted. They're going to kill you. You're going to be persecuted. Verse 10, many are going to be offended, betray one another, hate one another. Wait a minute. Verse 9 through 10, what we read, didn't that happen to the apostles during their time? If you hold that thought, okay, I know your hand's at James 5. Go to Matthew 10, Matthew 10. So we're going to jump around verses. That's why I want you to hold all these thoughts, all right? I'm going to try the best way that I can to organize it for you. That way you can understand how neat the connections are, okay? Oh, okay. Now go to Matthew 10. Nice. Matthew chapter 10. Now when you go to Matthew chapter 10, we take verse 16 and onward as an application to us, right? Matthew 10, 16. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the council, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. And it shall be brought before governors and kings uh, for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour that ye shall speak. Now notice right here that these, uh, that these verses definitely sounds like what the disciples went through, right? Yeah, exactly. During their time period, during the first centuries of persecution. And Christians quite often take this passage uh, where we can learn from that. 
Now, the thing is, a lot of people don't pay attention to this, though, is that if you look at verse 22, verse 22, it's the tribulation. Verse 22, and he shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that, what? Endureth to the end shall be saved. How about that? And then uh, when you uh, look at verse 23, it's, the, uh, but when they persecute you in this city, flee into another, for verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. See, the coming, the second advent of Jesus Christ is mentioned here. So going back to Matthew, wow. Matthew 24, if you go back to Matthew 24, continuing on, notice this is no doubt repeating Matthew 10. Yeah. It's the same idea. So in Matthew 24, verse uh, 9, that matches well with Matthew 10, right? They're going to deliver you up to be afflicted. You're going to be persecuted in the synagogues. Matthew 24, 9 matches well with that idea, right? Mm -hmm. It matches also with Matthew 10 about, verse 13, but he that endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Here's the key answer. Verse 14, and the what? Gospel, Gospel of the kingdom. Yeah. Visual aid to help. All right. See that? Yeah. See that? Why? Why? The church age was the interruption. If there was no church age, think, look, if there is no blue, do you see this? It's harmonized all as one. The church was inserted there and it caused that split. See that? So that's why there's a lot of tribulation doctrine mentioned here. That's why you have to understand that. that if that, there was no church age, it would have just uh, went on smoothly. But thanks to this so-and-so right here, it just caused a fumble to a whole bunch of doctrine. And that's why we get a lot of wrong doctrine today. Because <laughs> everybody is trying to apply doctrine, the kingdom here, rather than the church age. Even mid-acts mess this up. This is the cause. This, this transition and parenthesis of the church age is the root cause to like 99.9% .9 of wrong doctrine. I say dispensationalism is the reason uh, why you're going to get 99% of right doctrine. Amen. And it's the reason why there's 99% of wrong doctrine out there is because of dispensationalism. But this transition with this parentheses makes it even more so. Like Textus Receptus Manuscript Evidence, 99.9%. .9%, all right? That's how big it is. So that's why during the first centuries here, it makes sense why they underwent that, the first centuries. That's why it makes a lot of sense why the book of Hebrews, which is even though written at this time, it's supposed to encompass this time period as well. That's why it makes a lot of sense why it's going to be tribulation application. Well, why did they write that way? I mean, because of the church age. They didn't know that this was going to disrupt for 2,000 years long. They thought that Jesus would come down any moment during their time period and that the tribulation will be underway in just a little while and then we're done. But God's like, no, I postponed that time. How long? 2,000 years. la di da <laughs> All right. Now, now that we understand this, it makes a lot of sense. And then going back to James then, all right? Now, keep your hand at Matthew 10, all right? Don't let go on that one, all right? You can let go of Matthew 24, all right? Thank God, all right? But go to James 5. Make sure your hand's not lost there, okay? Go to James 5. Now, notice what James argues here. He argues what the Christian church should be doing is that, now, verse 3, notice this is tribulation. Ye have heaped treasure together for the what? Last days. This is tribulation. What's going to happen in the tribulation? Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is, <coughs> excuse me, of you, Kept by fraud, crieth. Uh, so we see right here elites, right? Using fraudulent means to control economically people and enslave them, all right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the cries of them which have reaped, 
are entered into the years of the Lord of Sabaoth, ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton, ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. So God is condemning rich elites here, taking advantage of poor people. Verse 6, ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Remember Hebrews 10? Hebrews 10 show that the saints, tribulation saints, they're undergoing persecution. They're being a laughing stock here. That's why verse 7, be patient, therefore, brethren. Yeah. Remember Hebrews 10? Be patient. Mm -hmm. Remember Hebrews 10 said, be patient because Jesus will come? Mm -hmm. Look at Hebrews 5, 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Yeah. See that? Verse 8, be also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. See, James is saying Jesus is coming real soon. It's only a few days. Well, thanks to this parenthesis, it's not that long. But once this parenthesis is gone, see that? It is a little while. It is a little while. So that's why it makes a lot of sense. This parenthesis answers a whole bunch of questions we have. Um, notice right here, verse 11. That's why, uh, verse 10 He's saying, Job, uh, the, uh, the prophets are an example of suffering affliction. Remember Hebrews 10? They had to endure affliction. They had to be patient. Notice verse 11, you have to endure. That matches Hebrews chapter 10. You have to endure. And then, uh, because the Lord is coming very, very soon. So, we see right here that it all matches up. Now, when you go back to uh, Matthew 25 now, Matthew 25, there's just so many verses here. I, I have to finish this thought. I have to, if I don't finish the thought, then you're going to get lost next Hebrew study. So let me finish the thought, and then I'll end it. The Christian application, I'll show next time. You're going to get a big blessing on the Christian application, but not now. All right, he, Matthew 25. Now, 25 is continuing 24, right? The idea of the tribulation. So in 25, look at verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, ah, finally, He comes down, right? So, what's going on? When He comes down, notice Jesus is judging the wicked and condemning them for not feeding the poor, for not taking care of the poor. Why? James 5 told you, remember James 5? Rich elites mistreating the poor. James 5 showed you that. We looked at that verse before. That's right, yes, sir. You know why tribulation saints are poor? Simple. They're not economically thriving here. Right. They, they refuse to go by the economic system. So they're all poor people. That's why in Hebrews 10, it's crucial these believers who are impoverished and poor, they need to be supported. If you don't support them, it shows whose side and whose system you're on. So those disciples, even during the first centuries, realized that. That's why in Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus made a big deal about taking care of poor people. Why? Because they were under, get this now, they were under a one-world government that time. A one-world empire. But you know what happened? It, it separated. It got messed up. Now we got independent nations, all right? But see that? They could have had, the Antichrist could have started through the Roman Caesar and everything right here. So that's why they made a big deal about taking care of poor people because in verse 32, uh, no, uh, not verse 32, notice right here, verse 34, notice they now receive the reward because Jesus come down, right? But then in verse 35, 36, 37, 38, and 39, and verse 40, Jesus Christ uh, shows them right here that the reward is based on feeding the poor people. See that? But then in verse 41, you burn in hell because of verse 42, 43, 44, and 45, you mistreated the poor. Now, people are using that for church age doctrine when it's the kingdom right here. It's the gospel of the kingdom being preached over here. If we go back to Matthew 10, that's why when you go to Matthew chapter 10, 
Notice, we know this is tribulation and first century, right? This is first century and tribulation doctrine because of the gospel of the kingdom. But look at right here. Notice in verse 41, verse 41, he that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whosoever shall give drink unto one of these little ones a cold cup, a cup of cold water, only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. Notice right here that you are rewarded for taking care of God's preachers. Remember Hebrews 10? Hebrews 10 said that uh, here are impoverished people that you've taken care of, but also impoverished preachers like me that you've taken care of. See, that matches perfectly well with Hebrews 10 in tribulation. Wow. See, I told you that I, you're going to get lost if I don't neatly do this as best as I can, all right, step by step. So all of this comes together with waiting. Now, I think I can do John later. So uh, I, will halt, I will halt finally the tribulation doctrine here, all right? But that should be enough. The next one, I'm going to show you what a little while means. A little while in tribulation doctrine is a lot more than you think. It's very interesting. Uh, it, it matches with what Jesus told his disciples in John 16. But when Jesus was telling his disciples in John 16, he was talking to them about tribulation here. He even said tribulation. All right, so I'll show that later, okay? Yeah. Father God, I pray that tonight's teaching was a blessing to the hear, uh, hearers and Open our eyes more to the truth and the wonder of your words. What words, Lord? Connects the dots. It shows the full context of proper doctrine. It's an amazing book. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.